everyone. My name is Kelly Bacon and I'm your Nebraska Museums Association President. I'd like to welcome our NMA members to this month's Cataloging and Catching Up, a monthly Zoom chat to discuss relevant topics. We only have two left after this month's discussion in September and October. They will be held on the fourth Friday of the month at 3 p.m. Central Time, 2 p.m. Mountain Time. If you can't make, to, make it to one of those or want to re-watch one of our previous meetings, we will record them for viewing later. Each month, we will have a different theme and host leading our conversation. This month's theme is a continuation of last month's when we talked about racial disparity and minority representation in our museums. If you're interested in hosting a future discussion, please contact me or another board member. Not everyone in this meeting has video capability, so if you have a question, please tell us your name and your organization before asking your question. You can also use the chat feature and we will ask your question for you. Due to the number of people in this meeting, we ask that you mute yourself unless you are speaking. And now it's time for our discussion. So I can't quite remember where we left off last month. We were having a really good discussion. I think Aaron, you were saying something about what things that you were working on at Saunders County Museum. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I guess I was kind of talking about an article that I wrote for our newsletter um, about the when the Klan was active um, in the county. And um, I was, that's basically just what I was talking about. I mean, I, I've sent the newsletter out and I didn't, I, I got one response and it was just that, that they thought it was a very interesting article, but that's the only feedback I've gotten. So okay. Okay. That, that's it. That's where I'm, that's where I think that's kind yeah. of where we're at. So yeah, because you're, are you, am I correct that you said that your board was a little hesitant about you writing about uh, that? Well, a couple of them were just, were a little, part of the issue with the article that I said, I, I had somebody else read it and I had, I had pulled some quotes from the newspaper and the newspaper was very positive. That's the only way you could describe it. They were very positive about these events. And she was a little bit hesitant about using that language in that article. And then another one was, they didn't really think it was, I think they were just more hesitant about the topic than anything. But yeah, I haven't gotten any responses other than they thought it was very interesting. And okay. Yeah. Of course, I haven't seen a whole lot of people either, so, right. <laughs> no, you know, so, yeah. Right, that does beg the question, would you get more responses if more people felt comfortable going out and going to in museums yeah. right now? So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, does anybody have, you know, anything else, you know, for, like maybe, you know, things that, you know, you've thought about in the last month since we, you know, had the conversation or started a conversation last month? Nothing. So um, I see that we have somebody from the SAC Museum. And I think that is, I mean, if you're willing to, you know, either type something in the chat box or, you know, unmute yourself, you know, and talk, I think, you know, just as that type of museum, we've talked about just, you know, historical societies, um, art museums, that sort of thing to get your perspective as a, you know, a more atypical type of museum in Nebraska. Uh, hi, this is uh, Brian York. Uh, I'm actually double dipping today. I'm uh, doing military duty and being out at the museum. So, and it's interesting is because I'm actually on another conference call on another computer. <laughs> uh, and so, sorry I, about I, it. This is probably a bad time to ask you that. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it's I, I just I just want to say I'm just I'm really glad that uh, you all have this set up. Uh, I think it's going to be very very beneficial for everyone. Uh, with us, I know that you guys are uh, talking about uh, a lot of different collection issues. Uh, we have really haven't run into many. Our biggest thing we run into are we have uh, uh, veterans who pass away and the children don't know what to do with the items. And then we do see conflict between families. Uh, we'll, one family member will donate something. Another family member comes back and says, no, 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 I wanted that. And we always work with them uh, to try to settle it amicably, of course, uh, but it, it can cause problems over time. Uh, as when you get uh, children, grandchildren, or even more generations 
uh, coming back. But of course, you know, our job is to preserve items and to care for them and uh, then work with the family and then work with the public also. Um, I know that we're talking about a lot of different topics on these, so I, but I just want to thank you guys for having this. And, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. Uh, I have a new assistant who's going to be our collection manager. He'll, he'll be joining probably next month. Great. Great. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah, deaccessioning and dealing with deaccessioning might be a good topic. Yeah. How to, how could... to positively, positively deaccession. Right. Yeah, that, I mean, that topic is timely anytime. <laughs> I am writing that down. You could also add, I know we're getting way off subject, but you could okay. also add maybe dealing with like long-term loans. I know I've gotten some questions for that and that would go along with that deaccessioning. Yep. Yep. Uh, and that's something that we can definitely talk about because we have, uh, actually it's a revolving long-term loan with the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force, uh, which is the majority of our aircraft. But we also work with a lot of other federal agencies on this. And we've run into a few times where we have individuals who they want to share their items. They're typically items that we go after, but they're not really ready to completely part with. And so if it is something that we, and our policy is we will only go after a long-term loan if we are going to display it rather than just hold it into collections. Uh, but we have a few, uh, I think three items from individuals that they're personal items and they are on the long-term loan. Uh, and over time, there's actually one that, uh, I guess kind of a challenge one is, it was an item that we really, really wanted. We really liked having on display, but the individual was ready to part with it, but they wanted to part with it for a fee. And we weren't in a position to purchase it. So we had to deaccession. We had to end the loan is how we did it. Uh, took it out of the collection, deaccessioned it. Uh, we did work with them on proper care for it. Uh, while they were taking it for evaluations and preparing to sell it. So we, we tried to work with them on that. Uh, and then mostly trying to build a relationship to possibly then get the new owner to loan it to us, which unfortunately didn't work out, but uh, we did everything we could to actually try to maintain the life of that artifact. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a question in the chat from um, Mary. She asked, have any museums been updating exhibits to be more inclusive or representative of other cultures and races? So I, um, I don't know, Lynn might want to jump in here too. Um, I'm not on the, I haven't really been participating in the, in the exhibits committee lately. Um, because I've been, we're kind of inundated right now with our digital uh, digital initiative. Um, so I kind of stepped back from that. Um, but I do know that the collection or the exhibits committee that we have here has created like a, um, like a ranking sheet or an evaluation for new possible exhibits. And one of the key parts of that is inclusivity and diversity, um, as well as, of course, use of collections. But so I think that we've, I think that they are working towards making that an important part of, of future exhibits. I'm, unfortunately, I can't speak to much of that because, like I said, I've been off the not off I'm still sort of on the committee but um, I haven't been directly involved with it for about a year um, but when we do exhibits that's always a question we try to include whenever possible yeah I think one of the real challenges for a lot of our organizations is that um, we quite rightly want to build exhibitions based on materials that we hold in our collections. And so the whole challenge with um, inclusivity and diversity and equity and, and access 
is that we have not done um, as much as probably we should have done in terms of trying to build relationships with communities. And so the huge majority of our collections materials are dominant culture materials, if you want to look at it that way. Um, and so I think the question for us going forward is how do we, how do we look retrospectively at what we've got and more to the point, how do we build relationships with communities of color or other groups that are, are not represented in our collections so that we're perceived as places that are appropriate for stuff to end up. Yeah, I think Lynn, you bring up a good point that a lot of exhibits are based on what you currently have in your collections and you enhance with you know, pieces from other museums that you might get on loan, but it's based on your collection. So if we don't have those pieces, how do we get them and what organizations do we approach to, you know, maybe just get something on loan or, you know, talk to organizations about donations, but you have to, you're right, build relationships first. Has anybody started doing that in their institutions? Or, you know, have you been doing it for a while? I see people kind of shaking their heads, so. <laughs> well, I think, I think uh, the Nebraska History Museum has um, been trying to work with um, representatives from a variety of communities in in Lincoln um, and sometimes getting some of um, the native representatives to zoom in and stuff from um, like the Ponca or the Winnebago just because it's not convenient for people to come to Lincoln but in all honesty I don't know what they're doing in the happy world of COVID um, and whether that's going on or whether that's kind of on hiatus but part of what that group was trying to do was um, look at exhibits that are currently on the floor and offer some feedback and responses and there and and we did have some Ku Klux Klan materials exhibited and there were a number of people who expressed concern about the way in which the Klan was was represented or wanted a more nuanced and contextualized interpretation of that. So then we got into an interesting situation because we had curatorial folks and community folks saying, okay, who should have authority? Who should get to make the say about what goes on the wall? Well, I think that that's, that's, that was, I, they took it upon themselves to write a label that was very long right right but and and i'm not i'm not i'm not taking sides here i'm saying actually that's part of what needs to happen you know if if people are um uh, not sort of willing to put it out there and say gee i think this is wrong or gee i like this or or engage in the conversation, then we're doomed to stay sort of stuck where we are. And actually, I have a, I, I'm gonna grab a book because there's a book I think that if people don't know, it might be interesting for folks, hang on. Yep. Yeah. For people who, are, I know there are in different cultural organizations for you know, many different cultures and cultural groups and um, other minority groups in Lincoln. And so, I, and I assume Omaha has the same thing. For the people who are outside of Lincoln and Omaha, do you know if your you know area has you know, already sort of organized groups, you know, representing minority um, people in your area? As far as I know, we don't. Um, in the past, <laughs> excuse me, we've had, there have been groups that have been representative of cultural groups. 
not necessarily minorities. So like the big Czech population, well, there's the Czechs of Saunders County, but I don't think that they're nearly as active. I mean, it was, you know, we're getting, the generations are getting farther and farther from those, those initial immigrants. And so it's, it's, I don't want to say diluted, but it's not as, there's not that, that core group of people who are as interested in that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, as far as I know, I don't think that there are any um, groups that, like I said, that I'm aware of. I mean, I did some checking and, and Saunders County is 98% white. But, and so our minority groups are truly minorities within our county. And um, so I don't know if, if they have, and I don't even know who I would contact that would might know if there are some, mm -hmm. some groups. And, there, and we're, since we're, where we're located, we're close enough to Lincoln and Omaha that maybe they go to those places if they want, if there are groups there that they're, they're connected with. Yep. Yeah, and I have a message in chat from Katie. She says she's attempting to get her mic working, um, but they are working with um, a few groups at the Hastings Museum to help them with the second floor um, redo that they're working on. So that's great. And April, I saw you shake your head yes, if you want to kind of elaborate on that. So. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Uh, we are lucky here. Uh, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, the Frank Museum is actually located on U the University of Nebraska Kearney's campus. And so we're very tied into campus stuff and we have a lot of great resources uh, as a result. Um, UNK is also trying to expand its experiential learning, is actually making part of its credit hours like mandatory experiential learning, which means a lot of um, student involvement, uh, especially with different organizations on campus. The one that we have here that's very, uh, that probably would be best representative of what we're discussing is our new uh, UNK's Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And it's for, it's basically here to be the kind of like um, epicenter and resource for all of UNK's minority groups. We have a pretty strong international program and so these students that come from all over the world and internationally, uh, they find a, they find great, you know, solace and comfort. They're able to come here. I, I know a lot of I, I, I personally worry sometimes that a lot of minorities are nervous coming into like the middle of Nebraska sometimes because they're just not sure how they're going to be received. But luckily here in, uh, at UNK, we've established this office and it's been, even by the community, it's been very well received. And they don't just do uh, racial or uh, gender, they also do um, like LGBTQ, they host drag shows and stuff, which, are, which have actually been received very well by the community. But for our museum, we're hoping to actually partner with them as, a, um, as another educational institution organization so that we kind of ha all have that general uh, responsible focus towards um, racial um, issues and uh, you know inclusivity and stuff. Um, we both have you know at the forefront of our mind trying to do best practices. So by pairing with like another in like educationally based institution and group, I feel like that's going to benefit the museum as well. And so if there's any sort of you know like school clubs or groups or organizations or even uh, sororities or fraternities, those can be good resources for museums to try and, you know, implement the minority voice within their exhibits and stuff. Yeah, great. Um, and Lynn um, posted in the chat the book that she was talking about. Oh, see there, yep, she's showing it. So it's Letting Go, Sharing Historical Authority in a User-Generated World, edited by Bill Adair, Benjamin Filene and Laura Koloski, and it's published by the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage in Philadelphia. So. And it's, it's a compilation of a bunch of case studies from a variety of institutions, um, some libraries, some museums. Um, it was published in 2011 when a lot of us were struggling with how to respond to online commentary or um, people who wanted to be able to um, um, 
create sort of a wiki-like response to, to some of our interpretation, but there's also a bunch of case studies that deal with the complexity of um, cultural issues as well and, and underrepresentation um, of groups and giving people a voice. And I think um, it's one of the things that is the hardest for those of us who are used to maintaining collections in perpetuity to sort of perceive the museum as belonging to those folks out there rather than belonging to us. <laughs> and so, so I think there's a lot of challenges ahead as we try to make our organizations more responsive to the needs of our communities and to include lots of communities. Yeah. yeah, and we have a comment from the SAC Museum that says, in the past, they've worked with the Tuskegee Airmen Association, the national group, and mm -hmm. the Black History Museum in Omaha when they've updated their Tuskegee Airmen exhibit in 20, 2005 and 2018. And yeah, I mean, that makes sense to reach out to those organizations when you're doing an exhibit about them. So. Anybody else from you know, other institutions or anything? I have a feeling like for the Gage County Historical Society, you're probably in a similar position to like the Saunders County Museum. Right? Yeah. We don't have a whole lot of uh, minority groups uh, represented in our, our community have some of those like, like the Czechs at our, the, the Welsh, with the Welsh Plains uh, Historical Center. Uh, but not racial minority or it, those groups don't really exist. And they probably, if they, if those people are in, in community groups, they're probably in Lincoln, fairly close. Right. Yeah. And I actually see for, you know, both of you, because you, and especially while well, Saunders, that you people could easily join a group in Lincoln or Omaha and yeah, for Gage County, yeah, mm -hmm. Lincoln, you know, is close enough where they could join a group there. So, oh. yeah, um, Katie. So, do you know in Hastings, you know, of any, you know, other, you know, groups or organizations, you know, kind of cultural or racial or you know, gender or that sort of, you know, any of those groups that you could, you know, other museums or you could work with. She might still be having problems with her mic. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she must be. So <laughs> that's okay. Um, I see, um, Jonathan. I'm not sure what museum you are with. Um, I don't know if you. Yeah. You know. I'm with Homestead National Monument in Beatrice. Okay. okay. So you're. Well, location wise, you were probably, you know, you're in Gage County and in, you know, Beatrice, but similar sort of makeup there. But I, for Homestead, you're representing, though, homesteads from across the country. So do these, you know, issues ever come up? I mean, I know, you know a lot of homesteaders were white, but they weren't all. Yeah, absolutely. And we are actively engaging in the scholarship and conducting research on. Uh, black homesteaders, women homesteaders, uh, starting to look at various other ethnic and religious minorities homesteading. Uh, so definitely something that we're interested in and, you know, putting out digital content, working on uh, temporary exhibits and even updating our permanent exhibits to uh, try and better tell that side of the story. Great. Yeah, because I think you're one of the you know, museums that we have in Nebraska that really is looking at a national scope and not a local or a county or, you know. So, yeah, that's great. You'll have a lot of resources, I'm sure, to use, and I'm sure it'll really enhance your exhibits, and I hope that's going to be helpful for you, and you get good feedback. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Katie, did you hear my question to you earlier? I don't know if you're able to, you know, respond or anything right now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Woo! 
I did not hear your question. Okay, that's that's quite all right. I was asking, so I've just sort of been asking and for people who live outside of Lincoln and Omaha, if they have, you know, other organizations and groups that uh, either are representing different ethnic groups or cultural groups or, you know, race, gender, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, we do a lot working with Hastings College, um, kind of similar to what UNK was doing, tapping into their exchange students. Um, we also work with migrant workers who come up every summer through Head Start. Um, and that's kind of gotten us in with the Hispanic community trusting us. We face a lot of unsureness from them because we are city owned. They don't know how far city government goes within our building. Um, and we've kind of learned some tips from them. For example, whenever we have an event, they need to be able to bring their children with them and they need to be in a safe space and know that they're in a safe space. Um, obviously having a native speaker has been way more beneficial for us too. Um, and having one that will fully translate correctly, some of them like to sugarcoat a little bit. They don't want to offend you or the family or, um, and then we've been working a lot with Haskell University, mainly because in theory, we are getting the traveling boarding school exhibit in November and having some of them come up and talk. I say in theory, because it might be moving to web-based now, but slowly making connections. A lot of them, I think we knew it would take a lot of time, but we weren't maybe thinking years, which some of them have been taking. Um, as we redo our second floor though, we're trying to, anytime we tell a story that's not like Euro-American, that we aren't the ones telling that story, that it's coming from that community. And when they get to see that fully full out, we found out they've been a lot more willing to chat with us and kind of share their viewpoints. And that's also helped us gain artifacts then because they see how it's going to display what the story is and that like we're not going to twist their words. Um, it's a very long process that hopefully we're slowly getting better at. Yeah, that's that's great. I just thought of kind of a slightly different question for Vonda, since she works in conservation. I don't know if she's going to be able to answer this or not, but I'm wondering, have you seen different types of collections items, you know, either from museums or in personal collections, come to you for conservation work after all of the conversations um, about, you know, race and gender and minorities have really come to the forefront? Um, just a few things, um, but mainly it's through, you know, our collection items. Like the, we had the uh, Black Lives Matter poster that came in that we'll need to be um, doing some conservation work on. So it's not a whole lot yet, but maybe it's just as exhibits get planned for um, these different types of groups and stuff that we may actually end up seeing more, which would be nice. Right, yeah, because I, I was thinking that, you know, items will, you know, need to be on exhibit and then, I mean, it logically makes sense that some of those items will probably need some sort of conservation work and you are a logical place to get, you know, some yeah. of the conservation <laughs> work done. So, because, yeah, a lot of the things you see from museums are sure are, I'm sure are being conserved because they're going to be put on exhibit. So you have kind of a, an idea of, you know, what museums are thinking. Yes. <laughs> and then I'm beyond that. I mean, we've had a few people in minority groups where they brought in like family things. So that's, it's more of a individual thing as opposed to museums, but there is some of that. So a few things here and there scattered. Yeah, um, I just lost my train of thought. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have anything, you know, relevant, you know, right now to, as I lost my train of thought with the next question I was going to ask? <laughs> um, so coming from the collections standpoint, we, um, we're working on updating our collections plan. I don't know or collections uh so there's so many words 
Um, but anyways, this would be like the things that we have in our collection. We have a lot of in our collection and then things that we are searching for. So we're updating that to make sure it reflects diversity and inclusion as well um, as we write this document. Um, has anybody else taken that on collection plans? So we've been looking at other places too and, uh, and reading their statements and things like that too. And that's been interesting, larger institutions. So, oh, hang on, sorry, someone's at my door. Libby, I know, you know, with you working at Lords and Gardens, I mean, you're dealing with live collections and with plants and, you know, gardens and that sort of thing. So, but I think, you know, these issues can still be relevant to you because I know you have themed gardens for, you know, different parts of the world, you know, different cultures, like your, you know, Japanese garden. Yeah, we have a That's Japanese garden. We have the Lithuanian garden. Uh, a lot of it is very, still very white. Uh, which is something that we also struggle with even to get people here to the garden because it's another thing kind of like an art museum and stuff like that where we're perceived to be elitist I guess is probably the best way to put it um, and it's trying to open it up to people who are you know minority lower income all that kind of stuff to try and get them to just visit the gardens and that's been an issue that we've, you know, I mean, even with our staff, I mean, we've tried to, you know, we're discussing that as well, but it's just something that we're trying to figure out on, you know, on, in some way to, uh, cause most of the stuff that we've done, even with our festivals and things like that have been either white or, uh, uh, Japanese, I guess, are probably the two that we've gone with most of the time. We have not done a lot with other cultures. I'm hoping one of these days we'll get moving in those directions. But it's it's something that yeah we do we do struggle with. Yeah, yeah. I just I hadn't thought about that. You know, even last month when we were talking about it with the gardens, you do have culturally themed garden so an opportunity to bring people in but they also have to know that it's there and feel comfortable and, and welcomed and well, well and, yeah and we still bring in you know we do bring in exhibits and stuff you know smaller exhibits and stuff like that but you know having representation from minority artists would be a good thing to start doing i don't know you know it's something that we need to discuss and stuff like that because it's been you know artist groups and things like that that we've had come in but nothing kind of offshoot from that mainstream. Do you, do you guys have um, prairie yes. plants and stuff? So is that the whole issue of Indian corn? Is that something that would be a way that you could get at? I know. Um, I think they're looking or, at that yeah, for even is growing a lot of that in Omaha there. Yeah, I think they're looking at a lot of that for when we redo our children's garden and stuff yeah. like that and how, and how to handle that kind of stuff to teach people because we are supposed to be, especially about the Midwest and gardens that thrive in the Midwest mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So I know they're looking at that for when they redo the children's garden here in a couple of years, mm -hmm. or actually it's going now, but they're you know not gonna announce anything for Right. A while. right. Well, and yes, you can start a garden, but it takes a while to build mm -hmm. it up and have it ready for the public. So. Yeah. Well, and if we're doing buildings and all that kind of stuff, it takes yeah. a while to raise all that lovely money. Yes. Yep. Yep. But yeah, what a you know great opportunity. And I like the idea of, yeah, doing a children's garden with like Native American, you know, plants yeah. and, you know, prairie. Well, I mean, because that's, yeah, where, you know, where we came, you know, where we started and all that kind of stuff. So teaching people that, mm -hmm. hey, it wasn't just us just showing up here. Right. Yes. Yeah. When you were bored, there may have been farms and ranches, but that's not what was here originally. No. Exactly. Yeah. I like that we have, you know, different types of museums, you know, represented every month. And it is really interesting how we can all kind of tie our topic into what we are doing in our own institution. So, so yeah, and I don't personally work with, you know, 
museums and you know collect collections every single day but you know we do you know research on historic sites you know across the state and we've talked about you know different things that we can do to really try to bring you know minority conversations um to the forefront one um we work with the national register of historic places program and next month we will be nominating a church in north omaha partially for its association with an ethnic, an ethnic heritage and the black community in North Omaha and how it was an integrated church from its beginning and that was its very purpose. And one of the um, longtime pastors there was very influential in civil rights issues in Omaha. So it's a really, really interesting and kind of exciting document to read. So we've even, you know, we've been talking about that in our office too, about how we can better represent the people of the state and not just the you know euro american white you know americans so. oh. mary have you seen you know i you work with you know more than just museums but have you seen you know from the organizations and institutions that you work with and have connections to you know, kind of change their programming and their ideas i know you have the speakers bureau you know have certain you know speakers or topics been more you know requested right now than others no our speakers bureau like everything else has slowed down yep. Yep. in time but um we have been um hearing from mostly authors who have authored books uh quite a few about the African American experience in Omaha or DeWitty. Uh, so there is, I think, a, an increase overall in um, interest in that. And then communities who, who get those programs are really um, quite amazed. This is history that, you know, they had never heard about. So it's a continuing, continuing effort, I think, on, on everyone's part to to help make people more aware of um, the history that, that they didn't learn in school necessarily. We also, I think, do just, uh, there is a real awareness. It's all, as you know, fairly new yet about the, the real necessity to make a concerted effort to better represent um, and be inclusive. So I think I think we're all growing in that direction and hopefully hopefully we'll get to a get to a point where we see some real success. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so for you know the people on the call now for your current exhibits have you ever you know received comments from your current exhibits you know positive or negative on uh, you know about the way you are representing the people in those exhibits Erin, I see you kind of perplexed and thinking me and maybe no <laughs> well, you know it, 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 it's I don't want to say that's a loaded question but you know I can have somebody come in and say, well, we need to make, you know, our Native American exhibit bigger, but then the next people who come in could care less about our Native American mm -hmm. exhibit, you know? Right. Um, so it's, it, it's, to me, it's, it's like a balancing act right. of, of what exactly, you know, do I have a whole big thing on Native American or you know, we, we currently have two exhibits on Native Americans. I'd like to combine them into one. Um, but, you know, that's just as an example, you know, in, in terms of, you know, we have an exhibit that I know, I know a lot of my exhibits are dated, but again, it's a matter of money and, and, and time and that whole thing, you know, about, you know, people are interested, you know, about the, the three main ethnic groups that did settle in the county and, and we have a, a really good map that was done a long time ago that shows where they were and a lot of people are very you know that's one thing that people tend to you know um to to grasp onto you know that's it's a visual thing and it's it's like oh okay didn't realize just how 
how people settled in those in those massive groups you know where they settled you know um and like the pockets of people and that sort of thing um, but for the most part yeah it's it's you know one day somebody's like well why don't you have this and the next day somebody's talking about the complete opposite and you know why don't i have a great big exhibit on the the railroads and somebody else is saying well what about the school you know so it's kind of you have to kind of just give at least from my perspective it's you kind of put just the basic facts out there and if they're very interested you know i can get them more information you know um i just can't have it all on display it's just physically impossible to do that um and that's it's one thing that that i'm having in trouble with um, is I usually, I mean, I have exhibits and displays and then I usually, if there's not enough space to put all the information that I would like, I have a notebook for people to look through. I can't have that notebook out right now because, you know, can't people having going through. So I'm having to try to figure out how to adjust that or work with that. So that's, that's kind of, kind of where I'm at. You know, I, I kind of try to just do the basic and if they wanted more information, I, I have the ability to pull out a file or a book or say here, if you want to sit and that's, that's kind of how I have to do it. Yep. Well, that's, you make a very good point here and that, yeah, we can't, you know, have huge exhibits, you know, dedicated to everything all the time. We just don't have the space for that. So, yep. yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what people are most interested in, you are very right. Something that one person loves and thinks this is the most important topic, somebody else may come along and say, yeah, I'm not interested in that at all. So to find, to strike a balance and find what people are most interested in, I think can be pretty difficult. <laughs> yeah, does anybody have anything else they want to bring up at all or? Words of wisdom. Lynn, I'm going to put you on the spot. You know, you've had a, <laughs> well, you've, you've had a, a long career in museums and, you know, have you been in your career, you know, seen a shift with, you know, I know we've been talking about this recently, but has there been a long shift or is this just more of a recent thing, you know, for, you know, where you've worked? Oh, I think this is um, a continuing saga. Um, and I think that's evidenced by such big national things as the fact that there's now a National Museum of the American Indian and there's a, a National African American Museum and there will be a, a National um, Latino, Latinx, Hispanic, I'm not quite sure how they're, they're referring to that museum at, at some point in the future. Um, and those are all reflective of the attempt to try to create organizations that are responsive to the incredible vitality and variety in our communities. Um, I think the, the challenge for the museum profession is that we're still in the model where the huge majority of professionals who are making decisions, building collections um, are um, white and, and represent um, the dominant culture. And there have been ongoing attempts to try to recruit more people of color. And, and certainly there is an African-American museums association around the country, um, but um, that that's part of the long road that we have to continue to be on because this doesn't happen overnight and it certainly doesn't happen when people aren't thinking about it 
and aren't moving in that direction. You know, and we all have like way too much to do and not enough time to do it in and not enough money. And there are all these priorities that get made, but, but that's also um, can sometimes be an easy excuse. So, you know, I think, and I have to give Humanities Nebraska a pat on the back for engaging a whole lot of communities through um, parent reading programs and programs in libraries and stuff that, that don't involve the typical sort of college educated, gee, I wanna go listen to a lecture um, kind of audience. So I think there are examples out there we just have to be more alert. Yeah, and I know, you know there is still this you know, perception of just museums in general being, you know, the ivory tower and that can scare people away. And I'm sure, you know, for a lot of you know, minority groups, they're probably the most scared of entering our facilities when we do try to be welcoming and inclusive of everybody. So. So yeah, I, yeah, there's definite truth to that. Have, have any of you had experience with taking your programming out of your museum into um, other areas of the community, either exhibits or programming that's been successful? My office um, partnered with our museum, the Nebraska History Museum, and they have done, what was it, three weekends. It was popular enough after the first weekend. They did it a second weekend, and then it was still popular. They did it a third weekend, um, but a bike tour in Lincoln and looking at um, African-American plays that were, you know, easy enough to bike to from, you know, our museum in downtown Lincoln, but yeah, that, and those bike tours have happened on a variety of topics over the years, but this was a very, you know, timely and appropriate one, and people responded well to it. Closest thing that, that I guess that like what you're talking about is is we normally do what we call lunch and listen. It's like a brown bag and a lot of other organizations do something similar. And normally it's here at the museum. And with the whole COVID thing, just this month, I did my first Zoom Facebook one and it it's it went very well. <laughs> and it's one of the good things that, because I was terrified about being on Facebook, first of all, um, but it opened us up to the people who can't get here. You know, I, we, I, I wasn't on the Facebook. I had a couple of, of people who were, who were monitoring like the chat and whatever. And we had a couple people who were there from like Kansas and Texas, you know, that are our members, they're members of our organization, but they obviously can't come and come to these events. And so um, since it, it did, we got a good feedback from it, we'll be doing that again. I, of course, have to come up with something to do. <laughs> um, but I think that as one of my board members said, you know, we've expanded our campus now. You know, we're not just this five acre area that people, you know, come to. We can now go out there. It's a little easier for us to, you know, reach our members um, and through either a Zoom thing. We did a Zoom thing first and that that worked very well, too. And then we did the Facebook thing. And so that's that's one way. Now, granted, that's not my normie related, but it's it's I mean, if you like, if you follow us on Facebook, anybody can can watch the the um, the program. So that's 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 on our list of things that we're going to start doing more of. Well, and I would like to to sort of amplify that point too, which is that that what we're talking about is accessibility for all. And anytime we broaden accessibility, even if it's just figuring out a way to deliver your content to people who maybe couldn't come to the museum for whatever reason. That's, that's supportive of the notion of inclusion. Yeah, and one of the things with, with that, you know, um, one of the, the, I won't say people, but we have, a, um, we have several uh, uh, assisted living retirement communities in Wahoo 
and one of them was on that watched on Facebook. So we don't have any idea how many people watched it, but that's a whole other group because a lot of them obviously can't get out. I mean, even if there wasn't a COVID thing going on, but they can't get out, but this was a way for them right. to go to a program that they normally wouldn't have been able to, to view. Yeah, you're, you're right, Erin. I think, you know, a lot of museums, I think, who have started maybe altering their programming a little bit to make it digital in some format, whether it's, yeah, Zoom, Facebook, you know, whatever. I've, you know, you know, it seems like some museums are really kind of considering continuing using that format, you know, moving forward, because you can reach your broader audience that you're right. When you do a brown bag at, you know, noon on a Tuesday, there's a limited number of people who can, you know, really make it. But if you are also offering it online, you are, you have the potential to reach a lot more people. And then, you know, recording it, you can watch it later too. But yep. Um, there's a comment from April. She says, FYI, if you do a Facebook live video, it auto saves into your Facebook page. So it's available to Facebook followers as a recorded video afterwards too. So it's a great, you know, great way to, you know, for people to watch later on. So yeah, I'm, I'm doing a program tomorrow with um, Morrill Hall, the University of Nebraska State Museum, just um, kick off Archaeology Month. And normally it's an in-person event for like three hours or four hours on a Sunday afternoon. And this year it is, we're doing it virtually, you know, 45 minutes, you know, recording it. But in this way too, I mean, our in-person event usually, you know, gets quite a few people through the doors and they come talk to us and it's great. But this event being online will help reach a broader audience and reach, you know, their membership in a, you know, in a different way. So I think it'll be a fun opportunity to, to reach the yeah, people who can't get to your facility for whatever reason. Yeah. And I was just noticing the time. It's just about four o'clock. So I don't know if anybody has any final, you know, thoughts or, you know, questions or, you know, words of wisdom they want to share with the group? My, my final question is for the Omaha folks about the $110 million science center announcement that hit like yesterday or today. What up with that? <laughs> Libby, I'm looking at you. I know, uh, I know you're looking at me. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to record this part. No, it's what it's. Um. We are a little bit past four o'clock now. So thank you, everybody, for joining this month. And we will see you um, next month at the same time, you know, same place. And it sounds like we have our, you know, topic picked of positively deaccessioning and long term loans, but we will post that officially, you know. And remind people with our the official topic later. So thank you everybody for joining and we will see you next month. Bye. <laughs>